In the wake of the October the 7th atrocities, most of the world shared Israel's pain. The nation was united in grief and anger. Today, six months on, the grief remains, but the global goodwill is evaporating and Israel's own people are increasingly divided. Yesterday, they brought a hostage home, dead. His family accused their own government of having his blood on its hands. The killing of aid workers by the IDF was declared a grave mistake, but suspicions are growing that it wasn't the only one. And Israel's staunchest ally says it's time for a change of tactics. We'll be joined by Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden to find out what our government is saying to Israel over Gaza and talk about the Westminster honey trap scandal. We'll find out if Labour is ready to go further in criticising Israel when we speak to Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy, with the party also facing questions over Deputy Leader Angela Rayner. And Ireland's getting a new Prime Minister soon. We'll hear from Simon Harris in his first interview since succeeding Leo Varadkar. He had stark criticism for Israel and said Irish unity is a legitimate aspiration. Plus, with us throughout the show, former Downing Street Director of Communications, Guto Harry, broadcaster and journalist, Leslie Riddock, and Politico Europe Executive Editor, Anne McElvoy. Welcome to Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. 3,000 years ago, Solomon, the ruler of ancient Israel, wrote that faithful are the wounds of a friend. He meant that true friends tell us stuff that hurts our feelings, but that we need to hear. This weekend, modern Israel's allies, amongst them the United Kingdom, are doing some stinging truth-telling. Six months ago, most of the world stood shoulder to shoulder with the Jewish state mourning the murder, rape, and abduction of hundreds of its people by Hamas. But after the killing of aid workers, the shooting of hostages by Israeli forces, and the deaths of thousands of Gazans, the majority of them women and children, global sympathy is daily draining away. Many Israelis say that it was always thus for Jews, that this is exactly the kind of betrayal they expected, and they faced isolation before and survived. Many of their friends, and indeed some Israelis, retort that Israel's own actions make it impossible to remain uncritical. Well, true friendships do survive. We'll try to work out this morning whether this one can weather the storm. Let's start this morning with the government. A little earlier, I spoke to the Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden. Deputy Prime Minister, six months ago, did you imagine that the October the 7th atrocities would still cast the shadow they are this morning? Uh, yes, I did. And I think it's really important that we remember six months on quite the horror that was inflicted on the people of Israel. Their borders were breached. 1,400 innocent men, women and children were murdered. Israel remains right now a nation in a state of existential threat, in a state of trauma, and indeed the Jewish community in this country feels that trauma, as indeed I do, and most decent people around the world feel the sense of the horror of that attack. However, there has been a change of tone towards Israel. Um, last October, when I talked to your colleague James Cleverly, uh, he said our backing for Israel was unqualified. He did call for restraint and discipline saying these are the hallmarks of the Israeli Defence Force I want to see. This morning, the Foreign Secretary is saying that our backing for Israel is not unconditional. And after shooting of hostages and killing of aid workers and so on, can you honestly say that Israel has repaid your loyalty? Well, Israel is facing uh, a very difficult enemy in the form of a terrorist organisation Hamas, that embeds itself amongst the civilian population, hides itself under hospitals and elsewhere. It's a difficult conflict for the Israeli Defence Force to prosecute. Now, nonetheless, against that backdrop, we continue to urge Israel to improve the way it's conducting that operation, whether it's in relation to, to deconflicting targets, as, as we saw with the, with the terrible death of those uh, aid workers, or indeed getting 
um, getting aid in to help the suffering people of Gaza who've suffered under Hamas and are now suffering in this war. Now, I think that's the kind of conversation that we have with a country like Israel, which is a democratic country, which has robust institutions. It's appropriate for us to have that conversation, but in the context of recognising that Israel has a legitimate cause, the prosecution of self-defence, to prevent Hamas terrorising its people again, which is interesting to note they've said they would do all over again. This might be right in principle, but the facts on the ground are these. A death toll, according to Hamas, and most people think it's something like this, is north of 30,000 since October the 7th in Gaza. More importantly, in a sense, their deaths in Gaza before October the 7th, strikingly, only one in seven of those killed in the conflict were women and, women and children. Since October 7th, that figure is seven, uh, five in seven. Five in seven of those die who've died are women and children. You can see how people might say, OK, let's be loyal, but are you still giving carte blanche to the IDF to behave in a way that is careless, cavalier, and results in this scale of death? No, we're, we're not giving carte blanche, and we have uh, robust conversations uh, with Israel, indeed, the both uh, our Prime Minister had conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Foreign Secretary had conversations with his opposite number. I would say that some of those numbers I would take with a slight pinch, so I believe some of them come from Hamas, but nonetheless... If, I, I, but at, I, at the I, same I point, I, Trevor, even, I'm not... Even if they're Trevor, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not disputing the fact that there is terrible suffering going on. There's terrible suffering that the Israeli people are, are suffering from as a result of this trauma. There's terrible suffering going on in Gaza. Now, that is why the position of the, the UK government is we want to get those hostages out, we want to get more aid in, and the best way to achieve that is to have a temporary pause uh, to allow that uh, to happen. But... That is the way that we stop the suffering. And indeed, it, Hamas has it in its hands to stop this suffering, to agree to that deal, to get the hostages out, and then, Let's... secondly, we need to get that security of Israel, and then we can start down the road to the peace which all of us are praying let, for. Let, let's just stick for a moment with uh, James Cleverley's desire for restraint mm. and discipline. Mm. How can you make that happen? Well, one way some people think you can make it happen is uh, through our arms sales. Now, we're not a major supplier to Israel, but we do spend them, uh, in one way or another, several hundred million dollars worth of weaponry. Uh, can, can I just ask you, just as a matter of fact, what legal advice have you had about whether we should have suspended such sales? Well, the, the... Or export, I should say, precisely. <coughs> well, well the, the way that this process works, by the way, we have one of the, the, the toughest systems of arms export controls in the world. It's, it's well respected uh, around the world. The decision uh, in relation to arms exports is one for the business secretary. The business secretary, in turn, takes advice from the, the foreign secretary, who receives advice across a range of different uh, issues. Now, the foreign secretary has not changed uh, his advice to the the business secretary. Of course, it's the case that we continue to uh, engage with Israel across a, a range of issues such as deconflicting uh, and, and aid. I would note, though, that we are holding Israel to, to standards uh, that we wouldn't uh, remotely expect of the terrorists that can, they are can, facing. Can I, can I just stick with the, 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 the factual question I asked yeah. you? D do you know when the Foreign Secretary last took any legal advice on this matter? Well, the, 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 the process is an ongoing one because this is an ongoing conflict. And by the way, so, it's, it's also the case that that's not just unique to Israel. That, that is the case with uh, all our arms exports but, around the world. But the thing is, we know that uh, the Foreign Secretary did have some legal advice, I think, in December. Has that legal advice been updated? Is it being renewed? Has he asked for consideration of the fact of, of events since December? Well, Trevor, I think you're, you're, you're tempting me down a, a, a line, and you, you know, what, I, you know what I'm going to say on this, which is that in relation to specific legal advice, that is something that the government has kept confidential in line with the, the conduct of, of previous governments. But based on legal advice that the, uh, the Foreign Secretary receives, the Foreign Secretary receives periodic legal advice. I can assure you, as a minister, okay. I'm constantly receiving legal advice across a range of issues. So, but, but what has not changed so, is the fact that he has not changed his advice 
to the business secretary in respect of arms okay, exports. Okay, so, so, so it's up to date. So in a sense, you agree with Boris Johnson that any suspension of arms sales would mean that we are, I'm quoting here, willing the military defeat of Israel and victory of Hamas. Uh, well, we have a process to go through in respect of uh, arms exports. I'm not going to start trying to preempt the, the outcomes of it. What I would say is it does, okay. it does, Trevor, it, it does worry me the, and, and I, I want to use my words carefully, but, but the, the, the manner in which some people are seizing on this issue and holding, trying to hold Israel to incredibly high standards. Of course, it's right that we hold Israel to high standards, but and I just think there's a bit of relish from, uh, from, from, from some people about the way in which they are pushing this case against Israel. Are you, are you saying that there's some kind of coded anti-Semitism going on here? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as, as that, but I, I think uh, it goes right back to the beginning point, which I think there's many people in the Jewish community in Israel who have just been expecting this kind of shift in approach to, uh, to Israel. Uh, we should think back to how Israel was on the day of that attack. The trauma it's still suffering. Of course Israel has made mistakes and made big mistakes, and we should hold them to account for that. But, but we are holding them to a very high standard. Westminster this week has been preoccupied by the revelation that explicit photographs and so-called spear phishing messages have been sent to parliamentarians. Um, first, can I ask you, have you ever received anything like that? Uh, no, I haven't, no. OK. Well, we now know that there are several police forces investigating, and it's obvious that there are several politicians and also journalists involved. Um, is the Cabinet Office investigating this? And if so, do you have any idea of the scale of this? Uh, well, I, I think the, the appropriate way first is for the police to in investigate this. Um, of course, uh, we have responsibility in the Cabinet Office through the National Security Secretariat uh, to, to develop mm. our understanding of threats, particularly from hostile states. Now, it's a long-standing convention that ministers don't comment on intelligence. But I think what I, I would say is that this is just another example. And there's been a lot of talk recently about uh, the, the state that the world is in and the, the rising risk of conflict. Uh, Cyber is a front in that. And it's it, important that we are we're on our guard across it, all issues, including it, cyber. Indeed, some of that talk has come from you. You made a speech a couple of weeks ago when you said that, uh, or you told the comment, in fact, that the China-affiliated actors pose a real and serious cyber threat to the United Kingdom. Uh, are you sure that this series of incidents uh, aren't the work of foreign actors with malign intent? Uh, well, well, first of all, I, we can't, I can't comment on uh, intelligence issues and uh, it'd be very premature to, to jump to those kind of judgments. But it is the case that uh, over the course of the past few years, we have, had, we have seen rising intent and rising capability in respect of cyber threats, not just from China, but from Russia, from North Korea, and from Iran. Now, we are raising our game against that, not least with the National Cyber Security Centre, but, but this is a real and increasing risk. And it would, it would be a bit odd if you didn't at least look at this set of incidents uh, as connected to that threat. Well, of course, we look at all, all cyber incidents, okay. but uh, this isn't one of those things where one can okay. make snap judgments. OK. Um, just as a, a fellow parliamentarian on Mr Rag himself, um, colleagues have been publicly sympathetic. But whatever his personal circumstances, uh, wouldn't you... Wasn't this behaviour at the very least irresponsible? And at some level, he gave his colleagues' phone numbers out rather cowardly? Well, uh, Will Rag behaved in a foolish way, and by his uh, own admission, he did so and has apologised for it. I think he deserves some credit for for being open and transparent about it. And I think it's right we should be open and transparent about the, 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 the range of the cyber threats that everyone faces, in particular elected politicians. All right, um, let's uh, get back to uh, raw, vulgar politics. The Prime Minister hinted this week that the government's prepared to withdraw the United Kingdom from the European Convention on Human Rights uh, if it prevents flights taking off to Rwanda. Is that on the table? Well, the Prime Minister is absolutely determined to make sure that we deliver on that commitment to stop the boats. Come the on, Rwanda man. policy is an important element of the deterrent and we won't allow the European Court of Human Rights to stand in our way of doing that. And that, that is an indication of the strength of the Prime Minister's feeling on this. So if there's a legal ruling that says you can't do it, you'll ignore it or you'll legislate to get around it? 
Uh, well, I think you're you're getting into the the range of hypotheticals. The prime minister set no, out. It's, it's, look, he's, Trevor, he's set it's, out a, a, a we've, position. We've got that, to. He's he's set out a, a position that he's not going to let the European Court stand in his way. I think that that speaks for itself. So we would. Uh, it, it is open. It is possible that we could come out of the European Convention on Human Rights sometime before the next election if it looks like it will thwart your flagship policy of sending flights to Rwanda with asylum seekers on it? Well, I think we're getting into the realms of, 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 of speculation. Well, the fundamental principle that the Prime Minister set out is he wants to get those... Those, those flights off, and he's not going to allow the European courts to stand its way. By the way, we have bent over backwards to make sure we, we, we comply. Okay. We've passed legislation through Parliament. We've been absolutely clear. I've always been of the view that our Parliament is sovereign, uh, and that extends to any international institutions. All right, well, some of this is actually about winning elections. It's uh, local elections in less than a month. Um, last time round, uh, the party chairman, uh, Greg Hans, told my colleague Sophie Ridge that um, you might lose a 1,000 councillors, and though that's bad, it's not disastrous. Um, what's your expectation this time? Um, what would not be disastrous? Losing a 1,000? Losing 2,000? Well, I'm, I'm not party chairman, and I'm not a commentator. Well, you have I'm been. Not, I'm, not, I'm, well, not, have I'm been. not in the business of, of, of putting numbers out there. Of course, You're an experienced Of course, these, the, this is a challenging backdrop for those elections, but these are really important elections. And if you think to the elections that are happening in London, I would say to your viewers, if you're fed up with the war on the motorists, you're fed up with you, Les, you're fed up with driving at 20 miles an hour down Park Lane when it used to be 40 miles an hour with, with, uh, with three lanes now down to one, thanks to Sadiq Khan. Uh, you know what you need to do. Okay. You need to vote for our excellent Conservative candidate. If, uh, you're, if you're fed up uh, with Birmingham City Council that's going bankrupt and spending £1.8 okay. million pounds on trade okay. union you, facilitation, you should you, vote for our excellent you, candidate, you, Andy you, 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 ha you have the party political broadcasts uh, available so, to you, so that's enough of that but in return then let's deal with this issue we like facts on on this program and the overwhelming fact electoral fact for you uh, is that the polls aren't moving here's some here's something you made two big tax cuts uh one in the autumn and one recently uh though overall taxes are going up but basically your 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 marquee promise 2p in the autumn, 2p recently. Uh, have a look at the electoral impact. Zilch. Electorally, it is actually all over for you guys, isn't it? The country stopped listening to the Conservatives. Well, well first of all, we're doing this because it's, it's the right thing. And I, thank you for highlighting this policy. Actually, today, uh, we're seeing that second cut in coming you know how to force, generous I am. Uh, which, which means I'm, that I'm sure it's an, not average, working. an average person is seeing their tax cut by £900. That is the biggest well, tax cuts for, uh, a, for a generation. Uh, uh, when it comes to your point about... Except the, if the, they the, move into a new the, threshold. The, but... the, the, the polls... And this is what happens in election years. These polls still, to a certain extent, are, are indications of people's frustration, particularly after being no, no, in power no, for no, 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 40 no, no, years. No, no, no. no, Trevor, no. You, look, look, you that, ask me that this, is absolutely you, you ask, flat. You ask me this question, it, you need to allow me to finish the point. No. As, no. We, as we get into an actual election campaign, and this uh, almost certainly is an election uh, year, we move from a kind of referendum on the government to a choice. And I'm confident, as people face that choice, and they look at the, the threat of Labour, whether it's building over the green belt in my constituency, carte blanche to do that, whether it's in relation to their employment laws, which are going to, to destroy uh, the jobs market, or it's in relation to their, their sums right. that don't add up, versus our plan, you will see those okay. numbers narrowing. I'm totally confident okay. of that. Um, a few days ago, you put out a poster online saying that Britain was the second most powerful nation in, in the world. Here it is, uh, we, in case you uh, didn't see it yourself. Um, it's been deleted, it's mysteriously disappeared. Uh, why was it pulled? Is it because somebody told uh, CCHQ that being second best wasn't a brilliant message in election year, or did you upset the king, or what? what why, is that, why did that get pulled? Uh, I, I have absolutely uh, no, no idea why that happened, Joe, but I, I, would, I would commend the sentiment there, which is the strength that the UK it's has. Great to be number, the, great to be second. The, well, when you're, when you're up against the, the United States of America in terms of its global power, but actually, if you look at our, our armed forces, uh, the soft power of whether it's 
the, the Premier League, which I think is being demonstrated there, whether we look at artificial intelligence, where uh, we oh, are right. a genuine world leader, <laughs> okay. across all these areas, we have so much to be proud of in this country, and I think that's what that, that, that poster was seeking to do. Oliver Dowden, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thanks, Trevor. Let's see what uh, panel made of all that. We're joined all morning by Gudho Harry, who was Downing Street's Director of Communications, under Boris Johnson. The journalist and broadcaster, Leslie Riddick, and Politico Europe's executive editor, Anne McElvoy, who also hosts the Power Play podcast. Um, Guto, uh, obviously the big story today is Israel and Gaza. And I, I, I was surprised. Oliver Dowden, very robust, uh, still in support of Israel. Um, there's no prospect of change, as far as we can see, for example, on all arms sales. No, not from him, but the tone has definitely changed. When you have on the front page of the Express today, the Prime Minister saying essentially this is not acceptable. When you have David Cameron, who from arriving as Foreign Secretary has, I think, been pretty robust on trying to rein in Israel, I think they are moving slowly but surely towards a position of holding Israel more to account. For some of us, why is it taking so long? Why do we have to have the names of three aid workers? people we can relate to, we can, we can recognise, we can imagine the homes they go back to here, before we suddenly realise that more than 30,000 people have died. Why don't we get the names of those? Why don't we get the stories of all those young children who've been killed in Gaza? Maybe we'd care more about them and the what looks increasingly like indiscriminate slaughter to me. And so, yes, the government's changing, but a bit too slow for my liking and still not hard enough. Leslie, the, um, I, I suppose the central question that's, been, that's arisen this week is whether what, is, what happened to these seven aid workers is, as the Israelis described, a grave mistake, or is it a grave mistake that's part of a pattern? Um, do you think that there's any prospect, actually, that eventually uh, the kind of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder stance of the, America, uh, the Americans and British might change? Yes. Um, and, and actually, the, the, this movement, which I have to say looks pretty glacial to me on the Oliver Dowden front, is just massively too slow. Um, I mean, public opinion has moved really considerably on this in Britain and to some degree in the States. Um, it's beginning to work its way through into electoral politics. Obviously, I come from Scotland. Um, there is not a political leader there, except for the Scottish Tories, and then even a bit wobbly, um, who isn't really adamant that there should be a ceasefire. From October, Hamza Youssef was talking about that. The Scottish Labour leader, Anna Sarwar, agrees. Um, you know, that's, I think, where public opinion is with all of this. And the, the kind of what you hear from politicians just sounds so infinitely almost contemptuous of what we see day in, day out. I mean, we either, every broadcaster is fabricating material or we're watching women and children being slaughtered every single night. And, uh, you know, the thing is for the IDF and the pattern of what's happening is that people obviously, even within Israel, are pointing out that there was the accidental killing of their own hostages, tragically trying to reach safety. So it feels like there's impunity it feels, from comments Alan Duncan made about uh, the settlers in the West Bank, it feels as if there's an the ownership there. The former Conservative there, Minister. And yeah. you can do what you like. And that's not OK, and it's not OK for a UK government that has, by the sound of it, according to Alicia Cairns, got legal advice that it is now actually acting in infringement of international law by not uh, halting arms sales. And uh, the, I suppose the issue here, we talked about this before on this programme, is the e extraordinary trajectory in the, work, the global leader's stance towards Israel. Six months ago, 100%, right there, Israel has to do what it's got to do, to today... I think that what lies behind that, and you're absolutely right about that, and as much as obviously the government tends to end up in the firing line on this, it was also true for, for Labour. I remember doing an interview, we got David Lamy uh, uh, on your show today. I mean, it was, you know, you, you really couldn't get, peel him apart from this idea that Israel has a right to defend itself, we would do exactly the same. Th there was a sense of unconditionality about that. I think that's now come back to haunt both of the main parties. 
whether it would have made a lot of difference, I think we sometimes delude ourselves, whether or not Israel really, like obviously the support of as many allies as possible, yes, it relies most heavily on, on the US for military supplies. But for instance, we don't hear very much from Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Arabia and other, other countries in the region are actually quite happy to see Hamas cleaned out, as they would see it, um, of, of Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, because they, they are also concerned about this. What maybe worries me, and I, I will slightly put my argument a bit on the other side, because you've heard your other two panelists' views, I've not heard the word Hamas very much in the last days. When people said they'd like a, a ceasefire, well, with whom? That, uh, two, it takes mm. two to make a ceasefire. Hamas is a terror-designated organisation, also something worth uh, worth remembering here, that you're not talking about here a ceasefire that's a negotiation with, with a, a, an accountable or democratic a power or force. And I think that's going to become the big question. What is this ceasefire? When should it happen and on what terms? It would be very unwise, I think, of Western allies to forget that as the pressure mounts on Israel for justifiable reasons that we've just heard because of what is happening in Gaza and the great suffering there. It's going to come down in the end to whether Netanyahu is solid on what he thinks he can achieve. I think his time is running out to show that he really has made this progress on Hamas and that people can see an end to this phase of the war. Uh, I, I suppose, um, Leslie, uh, the Israelis might say they're being punished for being a uh, democratic state that pays attention to opinion, uh, whereas, as uh, Anne is suggesting, it, everybody thinks you can't do anything about Hamas, so we don't need to bother uh, leaning on them at all. Uh, yeah, and I mean, since the, the, the kind of civil side of Hamas moved out, actually, f for, from Gaza, so that the only part yeah, of all, Hamas... The have all gone yeah, to they've Qatar. All, and they're, you know, not exactly sitting with their feet up, but they're not sitting in a war zone. So the, the Hamas representatives who are left um, are the military wing. So that is a terrifying experience, actually, I'm sure, for, uh, and reportedly so, for people in Gaza, because you cannot, uh, you can't say anything about the Hamas rule because you've got a military occupation there by Hamas as much as anything else. So this is not going to be a walk in the park, just as it wasn't a walk in the park back in 1993, when the Oslo Accords created a fragmentary moment where there could be some kind of progress. So I guess what the rest of the world's looking at is, do you think, and I've got to say, coming from Northern Ireland, I've seen this whataboutery all my life. One person's hurt, the hurt of one side set against the hurt of the other. And all it did was give us 30 years of civil war. So we've got to get to a stage where, you know, your good friends, as it were, are saying, trying to place a template on all that hurt, which is to try and find some resolution out of it. And that's well, my problem, Trevor, well, is this is not only, as far as I'm concerned, immoral, possibly illegal, but it's counterproductive. The idea you can clean out Hamas and then we all live happily ever after, it's nonsense. The slaughter that is going on in Gaza today is going to create the Hamas of tomorrow and a decade from now and a decade from now. They may be called something else, yep. but we are breeding people who will devote their lives to revenge for the death of their children. Sadly, I, uh, I suspect that... Uh, our successors will be talking about this long after yeah. they're gone. Um, the other big story of the week domestically has been this uh, spear fishing uh, episode. Um, Guso, what's, um, how seriously should we take this? I, I'm sympathetic to people in politics because they are massively scrutinised. Uh, they are held to a really high standard, as they should be. But they are targets for people. Now, on this particular occasion, I don't know enough about it, but I think one person in particular behaved, you know, badly. And actually sharing the numbers of your colleagues without checking with them uh, that they're happy for you to say, it's just basic good manners. You know, I wouldn't give your number out to anyone unless I checked Thank with you heavens. first, you know. <laughs> good to um, know. So I don't, I don't fault the guy for falling for a sort of, you know, one of the oldest tricks in the book. It's a little bit pathetic. It's a little bit beneath what you would expect of somebody who's elected. And I must say the contrast between his behaviour and some of the MPs and journalists, excellent piece by uh, Harry York in the Sunday Times today, just receiving the same thing, alarm bells going off, and actually just saying, who are you? How do I know you? This doesn't feel right. And no, I'm not going to open that picture. OK, reassured that what happens in this studio stays in this studio. Thank you, Good. <laughs> it's coming up to nine o'clock. You're watching Sunday Morning with Trevor Phillips. In the last hour, the Deputy Prime Minister told this programme that the government is having robust conversations with Israel and that he recognises terrible suffering in Gaza. Oliver Dowden said there was a challenging backdrop for his party in upcoming local elections. Lots more to come this morning. 
Shortly, we'll hear from Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lamy. Plus, we'll hear what it's like on the ground in Gaza from Médecins Sans Frontières uh, Secretary General. And it's all changed at the top of Ireland's government. Simon Harris will become the youngest ever Tisuk when he takes over from Leo Varadkar next week. He's spoken to Sky's David Blevins for this programme. Right, let's turn to Labour now. A little earlier, I spoke to the Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. David Lammy, the Mail on Sunday this morning says that it has evidence that Angela Rayner lied about her tax arrangements. Um, what are you saying about it today? I think the Mail on Sunday has evidence that Angela Rayner, like so many families across the country, had and has a blended family. Uh, you meet someone, they have children, a, a, a previous um, arrangement. Many families up and down the country live in more than one home. Uh, that's what the photos I saw reflects, and it's consistent with the advice that Angela took in terms of her tax affairs from accountants, from lawyers. I, I don't think this is a story. I think well, the... well, hang on, it, it is a story because uh, what you're saying says that the place that she said was not her home was where she actually lived, and. No, but nobody's arguing that it isn't complicated and maybe some people make mistakes. Why didn't she just say, uh, I, may, I may have made a mistake here. The law says what you're supposed to do. You can only have one home. And maybe she made a mistake. Why not just say that? I, I think she's been clear all along. No, she says she's that, done nothing wrong. Yeah, so she's been clear she's done nothing wrong. Um, she has our full support uh, in that. Her arrangements... Uh, and certainly her tax arrangements were subject to advice from accountants and from lawyers. Um, she played by the rules, but yes, like everybody else, she had a complicated life and well, lived in, you know, spent time in well, her husband's place, uh, well, but also her place. Well, Lots very, of families do that. This What's is, very, the, this what is, is very the story? This is a very interesting <laughs> point, uh, Shadow Foreign Secretary, because um, if she's had this advice, why didn't she publish it? A, a year ago, um, she complained that Mr Sunak had pu published his tax returns as Labour demanded only after much delay. Uh, on Thursday, she said, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. He did. Why didn't she just get on with it and publish the advice if she's had it? Look, I think there's a, a different arrangement and expectation for the Prime Minister than there is in this context, okay, okay. we're not yet in okay, government. But, there is but Trevor, I just want to make point this here. point. But, and by the way, she said the same thing about David Cameron. Trevor, she wanted David Cameron's Trevor. tax affairs, pub, uh, tax uh, status published, even for a period when he wasn't in Parliament. Can so I, why doesn't she can, publish hers? Can I make this point? We're in a political season. We all know that there's an election in May. We know why these smears are being run. It's to detract from the £870 that families, average families, are less well off in this country as a result of the tax burden that, from the Tories. Okay. That's that, what this is really about. That, that, it's not about that, Angela that, Rayner and smooth. her blended family. That's very smooth. She <laughs> it's, she could, it's about Tory she could get, chaos. She could get rid of this let's distract, by publishing Let's distract she's not gonna, focus, she's not gonna publish focus on this non-story. And no, she's not going to publish that. And she's played okay. by the rules. There's an investigation going on. Let's see where... Let, let's see All where right. we get... But I'm, I'm confident that, that, that Angela has, has done nothing wrong here at all. All right. Let's... Um talk about, I guess, what is the most important story uh, today. It is six months since October the 7th. Um, we spoke the day after, I think, and on that day you said that Israel must do what it must do, but within the bounds of international law. Uh, during the past six months, do you think that's what Israel's done? Well, look, let, let me begin, because um, Alad Katzir... Um, one of the hostages we now know is dead and uh, we saw protests in Israel overnight. It is important to remember that there are well over 100 hostages, some may no longer be alive, um, in Gaza and this story begun with that horrific event on October the 7th. But 
as we sit here six months later, I think it is important to reaffirm that a life lost is a life lost, whether that is a Muslim uh, or a Jew. Far too many people have died, 33,000 now. Um, many women, many children. And I think it is serious when we have senior judges who are on our Supreme Court who raise issues about the clear risk of breaches in international law. Our former head of the MI6, Sir Alex Younger, says the same. Uh, and of course, I've said that I have serious concerns about a breach in international humanitarian law in regard to this. And it's for that reason that I'm asking David Cameron to be very clear and to publish the legal advice, because this is serious for the British people, because it would mean yes. that we are complicit in that action. It's worth saying, of course, that there uh, has been a letter published by another 600 lawyers who say exactly the reverse, and they say that Israel has had the right to do what it uh, what it's done. Uh, you, you've been calling that you called this morning for three things: an immediate ceasefire, immediate release of hostages an immediate and unimpeded aid to Gaza. Now, um, let's be generous and say that immediate means this week. Uh, what do you know that um, we don't know that would make any of those things, let alone all three, realistic? Well, on the first, there are talks in Cairo as we speak. And, of course, we now need an immediate ceasefire. The Labour Party has effectively been calling for a ceasefire now for over three months. This is hugely, hugely important that we okay, see an end to this conflict. These, and, and I, these things are immediate. They've had talks before. Uh, what, what is a ceasefire... It, I, I suppose I, Trevor, I, I'm wondering, what, what is the point of the, Trevor, the calling for these uh, things? Because... Well, the first thing is... You've been is, calling for them, for, as you say, for several months. My judgment, my judgment is if we get a ceasefire, um, more hostages will be released. That's the first thing. And more aid will get in to Gaza to alleviate the famine that, that's now taken over. Okay. So it's important to okay. assert that, Trevor, and that's why we do it. The whole international but, community wants that, but to get a right. ceasefire, both sides have to let, lay let, down their arms. OK, let's talk, let's talk about something concrete. Um, your colleague, Anna Sanwa, uh, says if there are breaches of international human, humanitarian law, there should not be sales of arms to Israel. And uh, Sadiq Khan says that government's not publishing its legal advice. Uh, you can only draw one conclusion. I think the government should be pausing all sales of weapons to Israel. Do you agree with them? I think their judgment is sound, and that's why I've said... Oh, so you think that they should... Let, me, should let, me, let me make the point. ...sales of arms to Israel? The criteria for the export and licensing of arms um, is effectively a criteria that is quasi-legal. It requires the judgment of government lawyers, and that's why we've been very clear. You know, the government published legal advice when our troops um, had, to, had to attack the Houthis in Yemen. They can publish that legal advice again, as they did in but, 2011 but, with the bombing of Libya, and they should do that so that people so, can so take so, comfort. So Sawan Khan are wrong to say that well, I, I, there, there should be a pause on aid on sales now, because that's I, what they're saying. I, I, they're not waiting for the, no, the I government's read, legal advice. I, I, I read what Sadiq Khan had said. He was very clear that they should publish the legal advice. Yeah, but he's, And as the official opposition, but he, we I'm, don't I'm, have I'm access quoting, to that I'm advice. I'm quoting here. So we he think, says they're not publishing legal advice. You can only draw one conclusion. The government should be pausing all sales of weapons to Israel. Do you agree with him or not? I don't think it's a yes or no answer, Trevor, because I've well, said... Well, he's pretty clear. He well, says me, yes. Let me make the point. For the avoidance of doubt, I have doubts as we sit here. Uh, that... Sorry, David, I'm just trying to get you to say, is he right or is he wrong? He says, pause. He's not waiting for the legal advice. Where are you on this? Are you, do you agree with him or not? Well, Sadiq may well be speaking as a lawyer. I also have experience as a lawyer. And I am saying that I too have doubts that... Uh, uh, that we should be sending arms to Israel if they are in breach of international human, humanitarian okay. law. So no and I'm saying on sales publish right the advice now. and we can know. OK, so you're, you disagree with, with Sawan Khan. Uh, no pause now. Uh, let, let's look at your wider uh, 
foreign policy in January. Um, in your Fabian Society speech, you outlined Labour's visit, vision for foreign policy. Now, you accept that the heart of your defence strategy would be NATO, part of the creation of a Labour and Foreign, Se foreign Secretary, uh, Ernie Bevan. Um, Donald Trump has pointed out that not every member of the alliance pulls their weight. Have a look at this. Um, I, most of NATO's 32 members don't meet the required spending commitment. Um, Trump's got a point about free riders, hasn't he? He most definitely has a point, and successive American presidents have made the same point, and that is that we have to get serious about burden sharing uh, and defence spending across Europe. Russia has spent 300% increase in its defence spending since 2014. Europe is 20%. That is not sufficient when all of us understand the real concerns that there are in the Indo-Pacific. So uh, I would support that call that there has to be more burden sharing, there has to be more defence spending, and for all of those countries in okay. the red, they have to do considerably better over this next period. That's interesting that uh, you've already found a point of identification with Mr Trump. Let's, let's deal with another point uh, in your speech. <laughs> it's not just with Trump, it's with Clinton, it's with Obama, uh, it's with yeah, Bush. But, Successive uh, presidents but, have but, said this. But um, <laughs> uh, given what you said about Trump in, in the past, this is interesting. But anyway, look, on your sp in, in, uh, another thing you said in your speech is this. Cancel culture will not feature. We will shake hands with uh, whoever we need to for peace. Do those hands include the Hamas leaders who ordered the atrocities on October the 7th? No, they do not. But it is right to say that if you're serious about peace in the Middle East, it does mean sitting down with Gulf states like Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Qatar, uh, states whose human rights records are not where we are currently here in the UK, because that is what will bring about peace. And it's important that those countries are in a new contact group that can get us not only to peace, but to the two states where both uh, Jews and Muslims on both sides can be in a country with safe borders. If, if, if that is the case, what was the point of saying that we will shake hands, with, shake the hands we need for peace. If you're going to pick and choose, I mean, is this a no, matter no, of no. principle no. or is it just convenient? Tre convenience. Trevor, after the John Major shook hands me... with the provisional IRA. At what, some I of about, what, I, what I talked moments. about in my Fabian speech was a progressive realism for the next Labour government. And let's focus here on the realism. After the Second World War, Clem Attlee. Yeah. appointed Ernest Bevin um, foreign secretary. He asked him to go out into the world. And what he came back and said were there are serious dangers. Labour committed to NATO and it committed okay. to the atomic bomb. Those were the real threats then. There are real threats now. And it does mean that with Gulf states, with okay. India, other countries who okay. are emerging middle powers, we have to get okay. serious about the interests of this country and the okay. interests of the global rules-based order. OK, well, just a very quick last point. Um, you can say yes or no to this. Um, you said you want to appoint a Middle East envoy. The very experienced Middle East envoy knocking about the place doesn't seem to have anything else to do. So, Tony Blair? <laughs> we want a Middle East peace envoy. I think but he's there. Tony has expertise, of course, across the globe. Uh, there are lots of people uh, and lots of people we can draw on okay. with, with ex uh, experience of foreign policy. That is okay. a judgment that Keir Starmer will make uh, All right. if we have the privilege okay. of winning the next election. All right. He'll be very disappointed. David Lammy, thank you very much for your time thank this you, morning. Trevor. Back to our panel now. Gouda Harry, Leslie Riddock and Anne McElvoy. Anne, um, this Angela Rayner story, it's not going to go away, is it? Yeah, I think that's the problem, as much as David Lammy and others trying to back up their colleague, uh, Angela Rayner, obviously very senior. She is effectively the, the side saddle to, to Keir Starmer at the top of, of Labour. If this isn't going away, then there's probably a reason. Now, that's not to say that her defence is not solid, but it does seem to me that they've had to go all in on backing her version of events. So David Lammy used a phrase uh, earlier on when he said, well, this is not about, you know, critiquing blended families. It's not blended families. It's probably 
problem. It's blended houses. And one of the problems, I think, is a bit unclear here to people. So, yes, lots of people do live, and they live between two addresses, etc. But there is still that requirement for there to be a consistency about your primary home if you're married, and also where you're on the electoral roll. Now, there seems, shall we say, at least a certain degree of ambiguity there. So either I think Angela Rayner has to say, put up a hand and say, look, I made a bit of a mistake here. I made it for a certain amount of time. I corrected it a bit later. Uh, sorry, you know, I have a very difficult time. I've got, you know, children with some uh, health challenges. Please go with me, understand me. Or she has to say, I'm sticking to the facts, and here they are. Remember that she's also a great kind of attacker of others yep. for hypocrisy, for perhaps gaming the system, and the wicked, wicked, wicked Tories and the many years of Tory torture, etc. So I think if you play that game, if that's your brand as an attack politician, you will, of course, get it back yourself. And I think Labour can have to sort of understand that perhaps a bit more if they're going to be in power in a short amount of time. I, I took, it's a funny thing. Uh, uh, David uh, Lammy reminded us, of course, that he was a lawyer. And what slightly raised my eyebrows was that he was so absolute in his defence of Angela Rayner, stating without qualification that she'd followed the rules. Does that surprise you? Uh, well, yes. And no. <laughs> in that, I mean, it seems to be a kind of characteristic of Labour now that it, it's that kind of nervous thing you have where you can't make a mistake. You know, Labour cannot make a mistake about anything. They have to be right about everything. As David Lammy speaks, you can almost hear him editing every word because he's having to think about every single thing. What ramifications? What will be drawn from it? What might contradict it? And actually, the thing is, the public, it looks as if the public are ready to go for Labour, but they don't warm to people who speak like that. Now, the irony is they warm to Angela Reyna a lot more because she does shoot from the hip. And people like colourful characters it, to a degree, so that might help her along. Here we have William Bragg, who made a mistake, coughed to it, albeit maybe a year later, and it was, as you say, pretty brum, really. Um, but there's a forgiveness, at least amongst MPs, because he made a mistake and, and admitted it. It seems a bit rich then that for a thousand quid, which might be what Angela Rayner has failed mm. to pay, she's being kind of taken over the mill. Blending the stories as well as the houses and all that, you wonder whether somebody could do a fishing thing with Angela Rayner and say, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. That's and actually what she to, said. To, 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 to tax things and, and, and get her to reveal it that way. Um, in the end, uh, Anne's put a finger on it, it's her brand. She is that straight talking, she's not like a normal politician, we like her because she tells it as it is. And that's why it's damaging for her. And I suspect if she just put her hands up early on and said, I made a grand out of it, it was a, you know, there was complicated reasons personally, but in tax terms, it was just a bit gray area. We'd all have forgotten about it a long time ago. Now, what intrigues me, Trevor, is, is there a scenario where deep down, deep down, though we won't admit this even to himself, Keir Starmer is hoping that this ends Angela Rayner's political career or the prominence in the party wow. because he'd rather have a number two who was more managerial, who looked more like Oliver Dowden or looked more like Jeremy Hunt or David Cameron because that's like what he's trying to sell. <laughs> or, you know, or, or Rachel Reeves. But, you know, it's sort of, but not a fiery, wild, Tories a scum because that's not his brand. So there's a mismatch yeah. here. And whereas Tony Blair and John Prescott were a fantastic combination in that sense because they brought different things to the party. I'm not sure that is going to work on an ongoing basis, but more importantly, I think Keir Starmer's got his doubts. OK, we're going to take a break, pay the bills. Um, next, with criticism of Israel growing after the killing of aid workers, we'll get an update on the humanitarian situation and speak to one of Benjamin Net Netanyahu's MPs. It's six months since the Hamas attacks that left 1,200 people dead, the worst single loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust. Since then, Israel's carried out bombing and ground raids into Gaza, where the Hamas-run health ministry says more than 33,000 people have died. Well, let's get an update on the humanitarian situation from Chris Lockyer, who's the Secretary General of Médecins Sans Frontières and is just back from Gaza. Good morning, Mr Lockyer. Um, the Foreign Secretary says this morning that there is a prospect of famine. Is that true? Yeah, well, good, good morning. And what we're seeing uh, related to malnutrition in a lot of our facilities, which are mainly in the Rafa area in the south of the Gaza Strip, plus also in the, the middle area 
um, is that we are definitely seeing rates of uh, rising rates of malnutrition. We are up to the uh, in the situation in in places like the Al Aqsa Hospital, which is in the middle area of, of of Gaza. We're in a really critical situation where our medics there are having to choose between giving beds to trauma patients who are seeking. Uh, assistance and, and medication and surgery for uh, some horrendous wounds and giving it versus giving those beds to to malnourished children. So we're absolutely seeing uh, rapidly increasing rates of malnutrition. What has been the effect on your operations there? Are you getting medicines in? Are you getting drugs in? Uh, surgical instruments and so on? Yeah, so providing humanitarian assistance in any conflict zone, and we, we work around the world every day in, in violent conflicts is, is partly in terms of uh, supply and getting trucks across the, the, the border. And what we have seen uh, this week is announcements that potentially more, um, more road crossings, uh, more land crossings will be open. That's a good thing. But that comes with uh, my, my positive response there comes with, with many, many caveats in that firstly, there needs to be much more, much more supply coming in, much more land crossings opened. And at the same time, that needs to uh, what we need to be aware of is that it's much more than counting trucks across the border. And a lot of the the, the narrative that we have seen in, in terms of supply in this conflict has been oversimplified. And actually moving supplies around the Gaza Strip is critical. Being able to have medics who are qualified, fed in a mentally fit state to be able to treat patients is essential for providing humanitarian assistance. And, and hospitals, if I look at it from a hospital perspective, are obviously more than four walls and a roof. They're about running water, electricity, fuel, communications, all of which have been systematically uh, attacked and targeted in this really horrendous and disproportionate war. We've heard this morning that um, our own government is participating in the effort to open up a new route via the sea, actually, uh, into Gaza. Uh, is that something that you're hopeful will make a difference? I think the only thing that will make a difference, a really, really substantial difference in terms of supply, and I would go back to my previous point in that, that providing quality humanitarian assistance and treating patients in a way which is really sustainable goes a lot more than, than simply getting supply in, is really flooding the Gaza Strip through the land routes which, which are there. I think we're seeing several admissions in the last uh, week, including the uh, announcement of opening a border crossing in the north. And I think also, by the way, airdrops are admission of this. They're not signs of success in terms of uh, the humanitarian assistance. They're actually an admission of failure that we haven't been able to get humanitarian assistance into the Gaza Strip in the amount that is needed and then be able to provide the hands-on treatment and care once that supply does get into um, the Gaza Strip. It's much more uh, supply, yes, but it's much, much more than simply uh, trucks across the border or ports. Chris Lockyer, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Well, as we've been hearing all morning, international pressure has grown on the Israeli government over how it's conducted the war. I can speak now to the Israeli MP Boaz Bismuth from Prime Minister Netanyahu's Likud party. He's also the former editor of the most popular newspaper in Israel. Good morning, Mr Bismuth. Good morning to you. This is obviously um, a grim anniversary, six months for Israel. Um, the international mood has changed towards Israel. How is that being felt where you are? Tough, very tough. Six months, the war is still going on and it's going to be long. We never hidden, we never hide it that it's going to be a long war. But I listened carefully to the uh, former interview you had with the uh, Secretary General of Médecins Sans Frontières, I think. And I heard him and I said to myself, look, he said he was very honest to say that medicine goes to Gaza, humanitarian aid goes to Gaza, more than 20,000 trucks. And six months, six months where our refugee, where our hostages were there, did not see doctors, did not see the Red Cross. We do not know if they were alive or dead. Medicine, you have no idea if they do get it or not. We speak a lot of humanitarian in Gaza, forgetting humanitarian of our own people. Hundred and how many? One was brought back yesterday. Dead, of course, unfortunately, he was taken alive. We saw him, we saw him videos from him, and probably in January he was murdered by the uh, terrorists who are there. So we still have 133 over there. I don't know who are alive, who are dead. They're young women, there's a baby one-year-old. As you said, six months. So of course it's very tough for Israel. Six months that the hostages are there. Well, I don't even know where the Red Cross, nobody went to see them. Does this seem logical to you? 
Well, Mr. Bismuth, uh, I, I don't think it has to be either or, does it? And we can accept that there are grievous wrongs uh, being done to all sorts of people uh, in, in the region. On the contrary, I did not say this or that. On the contrary, my country, I mean Israel, on the contrary, allows humanitarian aid from day one. We respect international law. We respect humanitarian aid. Not only that, I mean, we have even two more entries from our own, from Israel, inside Gaza to support the people. Humanitarian aid come from air, from soil, from ground, I mean, air and sea. When Americans came to see us in order to make this port in Gaza, it, we said, of course, immediately yes. When Jordan wanted to supply aid or any country, we said, yes, of course, this is obvious because this is Israel. We are at war against terrorists. We're not at war against civilian population. This is the big difference. But when you mentioned hospitals before, have you seen the operation in Shifa, what the Hamas, what the terrorists are doing in hospitals in Gaza? Look, this is a very difficult war. First of all, it's underground. You remember for years you told us humanitarian aid to Gaza? What have they done with all this money? They created Mr. this underground, Mr. but not underground like in London or in France. They've created Mr. underground for terrorists. Mr. Bismuth, can I just stop you there for a second? We I hadn't intended to do this, but you spoke rather directly to what uh, Chris Lockyer said. So I want to bring back Chris Lockyer, who's still with us, to see how he responds to what you've just said. Mr. Lockyer. Yeah, thank you, Trevor, for, for bringing me uh, back on. Just wanted to be really clear that humanitarian assistance in the Gaza Strip has been wholly inadequate. Um, we're trying to do what we can do. Uh, is much more, as I was saying, a question than supply. But the whole area of the north of the Gaza Strip, uh, the north of the Gaza Strip is a siege within a siege. It's almost impossible to have humanitarian access there. Hospitals are overflowing. The Rafa area of the Gaza Strip has one and a half million people packed in a tightly, tightly packed area. I was there myself, and we're, we're living with the prospects of a, a ground invasion in, in Rafa, which is wholly terrifying. And, and just on international humanitarian law, there are now 200 aid workers that have been killed in uh, in the Gaza in the Gaza Strip. Um, there was the tragic incident from the World Central Kitchen okay. just this week, which has 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 brought attention to this issue. Okay. But international humanitarian law okay. is being broken on a daily basis in Gaza. Okay, thank, Chris Lockyer, thank you so much. Can, can I come back to you, Mr. Bishop? Can I let's can I, can just I know take the contrary. The... I would like I would like I would like Mr. Lockyer to stay, and I would yeah, like to ask I, him, I, I just want Mr. To... Lockyer, Mr. Lockyer. Did you try Médecins Sans Frontières to see our hostages? Are you putting pressure to see our hostages? As someone who represents Médecins doctors, are you shocked by the fact that in Gaza, terrorists are using hospitals for years? Are you, Mr. Okay, okay. shocked by the fact that under UNRWA, for years, terrorists were having their headquarters and you said nothing? Still, you say nothing. How come much right, hypocrisy can we have from the world? How much Mr. hypocrisy Business. can an organization like yours Mr. Business, be? Thank can you answer me? But I, I don't think we. I, I don't think Mr. Lockyer has to answer. It's for very that. clear. I just want to ask question. One very quick. It's very last question, question, if I may. Very direct. Before, very before direct. we let you Am go. Am I asking a question? Are we less important? Can I than ask other you people? a question, please? Is, wait a second. And, Are my civilians less important? I'm asking you. How come? International organisations are doing nothing in order Mr. to Bismuth. see my hostages. I'm asking you, Mr. Bismuth. Uh, I think I asked a question here. Can I just ask you one? We've had um, the report of the investigation by the IDF, uh, and it's been described what happened to the WCK uh, group uh, as a grave mistake. Um, would you be willing to see to subject this incident to a further independent investigation? Do you think that's necessary? First of all, condolences to the families. That's a terrible, terrible uh, incident that has happened. A lot of grief for the families, and I, I, I understand them, and I share it with them. This was a mistake that should not have been done, and this is our mistakes, and mistakes during the war are happening, as you know perfectly well. So many, I won't give you the numbers because it's, it's, it's tragic, of friendly fire uh, in Gaza. Friendly fire, Israeli soldiers die, died. A few weeks ago, three of our hostages were killed by our own fire. It's a tough, Indeed. it's a tough area, Gaza. Wait, it's a tough area, and, no, and you know perfectly well, better than I do, that Israel never intended or never wanted uh, uh, to arm and unfortunately to 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 kill uh, those uh, uh, humanitarian aids. So this is clear. And on the contrary, we allow more humanitarian aid. We want humanitarian aid. Another Mr. thing Business, I want to tell you. you. Another Mr. thing Business, I want to tell thank, you. Thank you so much for your no, time no, this the morning. Officers paid the price. Officers paid the price. Those are responsible. 
kicked I, out, and you know it perfectly well. Israel okay, I, don't, I don't want to cut you off. I, I, I think you've made. The, I think you've made the point. I think you've made the point. Thank you, Thank you so much as, for your time. Thank you for inviting me, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Right, coming up, we'll bring you an interview with the soon-to-be new Irish Prime Minister, Simon Harris, the first since he succeeded Leo Varadkar. He called Irish unification a legitimate aspiration. Ireland's new Prime Minister-to-be, Simon Harris, says Irish unity is a legitimate aspiration, but will not be his priority as Taoiseach. He called the situation in Gaza and the actions of the Israeli government utterly reprehensible. In his first interview since he succeeded Leo Varadkar, he told Sky's David Blevins for this programme that he wants closer relations with the UK after the difficulties of Brexit. Simon Harris, Fine Gael, your party, has its youngest ever leader and Taoiseach elect, but opposition parties say it's time for the people to decide who should be the next Irish Prime Minister. So why not go to the people and seek a mandate? Call a general election. How our Taoiseach is elected? Our Taoiseach is elected by our Irish uh, Parliament, by the Dáil, uh, by a majority vote, and that's what the Dáil will consider uh, on Tuesday. That's how it works. There will, of course, be a general election um, in Ireland in due course, and there has to be a general election in Ireland uh, by next March. The polls suggest it could be a very fractured election result next time around, with lots of independents potentially uh, elected in constituencies across the country. In that scenario, it does Sinn Féin not have a better chance of forming a government than Fine Gael does? No, I don't believe they do, actually. And I think you are right to say that politics in Ireland is quite fragmented. Uh, and indeed, for British viewers, we obviously have a political system in terms of an electoral system that's quite different. So we have our, our PRS TV, our single transferable vote. And I think that makes predicting elections in Ireland a little bit more challenging um, than the first-past-the-post system that you have um, in the UK. But let me say this. Uh, there's no inevitability um, about a Sinn Féin government. We have a coalition government um, in this country that is working well, uh, that is stable, uh, that has a clear majority in Dáil. Aaron, uh, and that intends to continue its mandate uh, out to next year and then ask and then obviously the Irish people will have a say and a decision to make in terms of what the next government looks like. Speaking about that coalition government and the potential for an election, has the coalition not been slow to recognise the concern that there is out there about immigration in Ireland? No, we certainly haven't been, but we have been dealing with an emergency situation. I mean, there is now a war on the continent of Europe. This country has welcomed 100,000 people from Ukraine um, and have integrated those people into our communities, many uh, working uh, within our economy, many children in our schools, and many playing a very important role in Irish society and people very welcome here. But there's no doubt that has put huge pressure um, on our emergency accommodation situation when it comes to migration. And we're having to respond to that emergency um, in real time. Ireland gets immigration, though. Um, we're a country that used to see many people leave our shores and go abroad to seek a better life. Now we're a country in which many people wish to come uh, to make a better life. But we do need a fair and firm system. You spoke in your acceptance speech about taking back the flag. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you were speaking in the context of an IRA funeral, but there would be some who would suggest that the lack of policy around immigration to date is the reason why some in Ireland are wrapping themselves in the flag and arguing that Ireland is full. Yeah, well, I just reject that out of hand. I mean, that, that, just, that just irks me, quite frankly, because, I mean, the Irish flag is something I'm very proud of. Um, our tricolour is a symbol of inclusivity, of tolerance, uh, and of this republic and its values. And to see it hijacked by others um, is a cause of concern and something that I would always call out. The Irish flag belongs to the Irish people. Um, but it is, it is true to say that there are some people who seek to exploit uh, moments of crisis. But there's also a need for government to do, a, to do a better job in terms of listening to communities and engaging with communities. So I approach this task with humility. If we look beyond these shores then, Ireland has been um, very vocal in terms of what's going on in the Middle East. It's expressed its objection uh, to Israel's response in Gaza in the strongest possible terms. But given what we've seen in the past week, the deaths of um, aid workers, is it time for more than words? So what we've seen happen in Gaza and the actions of the Israeli government um, is utterly uh, reprehensible. It's appalling um, and it's grotesque. Um, we are seeing children being maimed and killed, innocent children. It is disgusting, it is despicable and it must stop. Uh, this country, Ireland and a government that I intend to lead, will always speak truth to power, just like our Taoiseach Leo Varadkar did in the White House to President Biden um, only in recent weeks. There needs to be an immediate ceasefire. The attack on aid workers was particularly, in my view, callous and chilling, and we will continue to call that out. 
we also as a country stand ready to play our part in a political process that brings about a two-state solution. This country, uh, and indeed the UK, know a lot about the importance of peace processes. This ultimately requires a political solution that delivers a two-state solution. Uh, you mentioned Leo Varadkar. There was not much love lost between Leo Varadkar and the Tory government. Do you think a new Taoiseach and potentially an incoming Labour government is an opportunity to reset relations between Dublin and London? So firstly, and I'm sure you're not being mischievous, but a matter of who the, who the UK people, who the British people decide to elect to their government is a matter for them. And the Irish government stands ready to work uh, with the British government. I'm looking forward and hoping to have an opportunity to have an early engagement uh, with Prime Minister Sunak. Leo Varadkar uh, did an excellent job in standing up for our national interests at an extraordinarily difficult time. Let's be honest, Brexit was a really difficult and challenging time. Uh, here in Ireland, we, I think, had to deal with five UK uh, Prime Ministers, six um, foreign secretaries, uh, six Northern Ireland secretaries, all in the space of five years. We had very clear um, national ambitions going into to that engagement in terms of protecting our national interests, protecting our role uh, in the single market and crucially protecting the peace process on this island and indeed the relations between these islands. That's what Leo Varadkar championed with colleagues. I fully support that. But I do want to have, I want to say this very clearly, I do want to have closer relations um, with Britain, uh, with the UK, with the UK government. Our, our relationships run deep. I was, only in, I was only in the UK myself very recently, last month, uh, for St. Patrick's Day celebrations. You know, trade between our two countries is worth 2.5 billion euro every single week. We know each other historically, through families, through friends, through work. Um, Britain remains our nearest neighbour, even if outside uh, of the European Union. And I do think a lot of good progress has been made in the last year. The Windsor Framework, the Northern Ireland Executive back up and running. And I do now think there's an opportunity to see how we can further improve those bilateral uh, relations. And I very much look forward to doing that and stand ready and willing and looking forward to engaging with Prime Minister Sunak in, in relation to that. Leo Varadkar was the first Fine Gael leader and Taoiseach to suggest that he would see a, a Irish unity in his lifetime. You're considerably younger than Leo Varadkar. Do you share that view? It's a legitimate political aspiration uh, for people in our country to want to see a united Ireland. That's the Good Friday Agreement provides that framework where you can recognise different political aspirations and a very clear pathway for those to be achieved. That's not where my focus and priority is now. And quite frankly, I don't believe it's where our priority and focus should be. We have a peace process that is enduring on this island, is in many ways one of the most successful peace processes in the world. But it's also a frosty peace. I don't believe we've had an opportunity to see the full potential of prosperity embedded right across the island of Ireland uh, through the framework of the Good Friday Agreement. People beyond these shores really got to know Leo Varadkar. Is it just continuity, Leo Varadkar, or are you bringing something different to the table? Well, I think everybody brings something different because everybody brings their own personal experiences and their own perspective. And that's what I wish to show the Irish people. I came into politics at a young age somewhat accidentally. My brother was born with, with autism. I started campaigning in my local community for better supports and educational facilities. Uh, I come from a background that I understand and get the struggles that people can face uh, in their daily lives. And I want to bring that perspective to government. I, mean, I want to focus on delivery for the Irish people in so many key areas because we are living through dark and difficult geopolitical times and I think that requires people uh, working every single day to show that politics can make a positive difference and impact in their life and I'm really looking forward uh, to the opportunities and indeed the challenges that that will present and looking forward uh, as an incoming Taoiseach uh, in this country uh, to working closely uh, with counterparts in Britain uh, for the betterment of both these islands. Simon Harris, Taoiseach elect, thank you very much. Thank you so much. In just a moment we'll hear once again from our panel. Welcome back. Let's check back in one final time with Guter Harry, Leslie Riddick and Anne McElvoy. And um, listening to Simon Harris there, again, a slight change of tone here. Um, do, do you think this let's take our foot off the pedal on the United Ireland thing is a, a sort of dividing line with Sinn Féin, who are on the advance in, in the Republic? Yes, certainly. And, and I think there's a desire, and you can hear it in that tone, it's almost very technocratic, I mean, listening, my first time of, uh, of uh, listening to Simon Harris at, at length. I was sort of felt that kind of Eurocrat tone, you know, let's, let, <laughs> let's slow everything down, let's gradualise everything. It's all a legitimate aspiration, but let's not be in a tearing hurry here. So I, I would guess that that is the aim, is perhaps to take some of the, the heat um, out of that without 
perhaps entering into an argument very early on about where he stands on the issue in broader principle. I thought that tone was interesting. I think there's a, also a contrast of tone with uh, Leo Varadkar in many other ways. It's sort of interesting for me at the end of the interview talking about warmer relations, mm. more productive relationships with London, the, the UK. When I started, uh, Trevor, writing about, which I know you're going to say is probably about 1840, but about, <laughs> you know, about the, the link between Irish politics and the UK and, of course, the Northern Ireland question, in that, there was very frequent to and fro. You, it was often a lot of uh, conversation and summits and unofficial contact. Therefore, it was written about, broadcast about a lot more. That has really gone off the table. There had been just such a terrible mood around Brexit. But even before then, a sort of boredom has set in and a kind of calcified relationship. So I thought that was the other thing I, I took away from his interview. OK. Let's let's talk about another troublesome neighbour. It's, it's a year on from the uh, arrest of the four former, I think he's chief executive of the, of the SNP, Peter Murrell, Nicholas Sturgeon's husband, for what happened? Well, see, there was me thinking that I was down here from Scotland to talk about the fact that it's quarter of a century since the biggest thing that happened constitutionally in, Scot in Britain, which was the, the establishment of devolution. It's 25 years since there was parliaments in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. But no, go. no, no. It's one year since a forensic tent went up in someone's back garden, and that okay, is okay. utterly uh, okay. compelling, spank, isn't it? Spank, spank. <laughs> okay, right. But anyway, but to the did. point. <laughs> but it did, yes. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, we're all still at a loss with this. It's one year since that happened. It's three years since Operation Branch Form started, which was, which the, was investigation, the investigation, which you have to point out was £600,000, not of the taxpayers' money, but of contributions to the SNP for a referendum campaign they couldn't hold because neither party will let them have one. Um, so, yeah, we're sitting waiting. And it's going to be difficult to have a general election with that kind of hanging over one party. Um, I mean, I think now it's got to the stage that it's not having quite the same effect um, on SN the SNP as it did, although it's clearly not good. Mm. People will think there's no smoke without fire. And there were such big personalities involved. Obviously, Nicola Sturgeon was also arrested and then released without charge. But people, you know, around Scotland are saying, basically, where's the beef? Well, look, I mean, maybe I should have asked the question in a slightly different way. It's, of course, four years since uh, Keir Starmer pitched up as leader of the Labour Party. And Labour's, it, if you look at numbers now, it may not depend on it, but for uh, the longest time, we've thought that actually Labour's return to power might depend on what happens in Scotland. Um, do we think that, Guto, that it now Scotland matters will matter in the way that we did, say, six months ago? Uh, I think for the general be, election, I mean. Yeah, I think there'll be a shift probably from SNP uh, to Labour in the general election. It seems inevitable just because they've run out of steam, their uh, heroes and heroine. Uh, have sort of been undermined and, and, and brought down. Sort of the dynamism is is not there. There was a an incredible energy about the SNP for a long, long time. They sustained it brilliantly. That's gone. So I think there will be a shift. That doesn't really change the outcome of the general election because it's shifted yeah, the opposition in, benches. Indeed. I mean, um, the, 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 con the country seems to have completely sort of discounted. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's made up its mind, doesn't it? But look at that. Uh, in, that's the most incredibly stable. Uh, graph, except for, by the way, the bottom greeny blue line, which is reform, which looks like it's eating a bit into the Tories. I still think that could close. And the reason it's not closing is not because Labour are doing brilliantly. They are not. And I remember what it was like when Tony Blair made people pine for a Labour government. There was an excitement. There was a buzz. Nobody feels that. Not even my, you know, most staunch Labour voting friends. But the Conservative Party still keeps inflicting acts of self-harm upon itself. And that, I think, is what's mainly responsible for the fact that the blue line is, is flatlining or indeed dipping. I think that's a, it, it's well put. I think there's also a sense of wanting to stop banging your head on a brick wall, isn't there, when we talk about those sort of repeated acts of, of self-harm. That is a government that is tired. It's, in a sense, bored with itself. It cannot find that kind of unity and drive. And I have to say, I don't think Rishi Sunak has been able to get around that. If you look to the profile of, of the leader, that doesn't seem to have shifted anything. And if you see that on the chart, I imagine we'll see that reform line. I have me back if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to see that tick up quite considerably as well as maybe, maybe Labour trending down. I was saying, I mean, I, I was watching my team play uh, another team. I knew uh, we were going to do football. <laughs> <laughs> of course we're going to do football <laughs> this week. And we were losing 3-2, actually, up to the last couple of minutes. And then uh, yeah. the, 
amazing Cole Palmer, young man, scored two goals. Uh, do you think Rishi Sunak has uh, a Cole Palmer anywhere in his locker? No, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. We're, we're sort of old enough to have seen this before. This feels just like the John Major, kind of, the, you know, the dog days of that last Tory period where there was endless attempts to try to kind of reinvent yourself, actually endless morality issues beginning to creep in as discipline disappeared. I mean, the problem for these two big parties is because there is no proportional representation in British politics, you've basically got coalitions as parties so that there's constant movement and wrangling and, and, and dissent. Okay. Uh, so that this is just going to be par for the course. And I okay. wouldn't write the SNP off, you know, on all of this just I, I yet, because it's... it's okay. I'm going to use a different sporting metaphor, rugby. My, my country, Wales, has just had the wooden spoon, which is normally humiliating, but it wasn't because they were a fresh new team. They're planning for the future. And at the end of every game, they came back. So if only the Conservatives okay. realised that playing till the 80th minute okay. leaves you in a better we, place. We are past the 80th the minute. Time. There's no extra time here. I'll be back next Sunday. Join us again, 08.30 next week.